namo tassa pakavato arhato sama samputassa namo tassa pakavato arhato sama samputassa namo tassa pakavato arhato sama samputassa putang dhammang sankhang namo sami so very nice to be with you i just uh, i was kind of running an idea past my own mind of uh, trying relating it to Matthew, uh, that I was finding hard to explain this week, but it was significant for me. So the 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 realization that the Buddha offers us, and what I've always been interested in, comes in that statement that we read, we chanted the other day. There is an unconditioned, uncreated, unoriginated, unborn, undying, the deathless. If there were not an unoriginated, an uncreated, an unborn, an undying, the deathless, there would be no release and no escape from the conditioned, from the born, from death. All right? So the Buddha offers a kind of, or the Pali Canon offers us a very enigmatic language. There is an unborn, an uncreated, an unoriginated. As a, as a, almost like a koan that we should reflect upon in ascertaining what what his teaching is pointing to. And I think if you get that wrong and your mind is always enmeshed in the created, in the conditioned, in that which is born and dying, uh, if, you're, if your attention is always on those things, then you miss the boat. And our attention obviously has to be attending to that which is created, like this tent is created and we're trying to create more coolness in the tent. So it's not a dismissal of the conditioned realm of birth and death. I went to uh, visit a friend in hospital who's dying and trying to help him through and then another lady after that who has got cancer and helping her. So we live in condition world these these bodies are conditioned but the liberation that the Buddha is pointing to is not a condition and it's very very enigmatic and very difficult to actually understand so what the way it's laid out is that the the teaching describes the conditions so it basically talks about the stream of consciousness that we experience as human beings. So we have, we have visual forms, we have audio forms, we hear birds, our bodies feel heat and comfort and discomfort, we have mental imagery, we smell the incense, we taste food. So we, the conditioned realm is a sense realm. We experience the conditioned realm through the senses, obviously. And we interpret the sense realm through our perceptions, through memory. Uh, I know that is Thomas. I know this is Matthew. I know uh, this is a deer fly on my neck, <laughs> and so on. So we have perceptions to help us interpret the world around us. And then we have a whole system of, of thinking and mental formations of, based upon emotions, based upon ideas that we have cultivated, and all these are, are, are enmeshed together in a flow of conscious experience. So that is our life, flow of consciousness. But is that all there is? Is that all there is? And, and the Buddha is saying, no, that's not all there is. There, there's something you're missing here. Now our attention, is, if you look at, like when you we were just meditating just now, your attention tends to be grabbed by deer flies on your head, uh, the heat, the temperature, a strong memory, an idea of what you're going to do tomorrow, right? And these, these, are, these are the conditions that our attention gets attracted by. And that attraction is both uh, based upon pleasure, uh, based upon habit, based upon displeasure, based upon uh, ideas of what I should and shouldn't be, what I should have and shouldn't have based upon memory of what I did have and what I want to have, 
based upon wanting to intensify a, uh, an experience to make it more pleasant or wanting to get rid of an experience to get it unpleasant. And all the time, our attention is taken up with conscious experience, with stream of consciousness. And that you need, we need to do that. I'm not saying that you can somehow live as a zombie and negate all that. But is there is there something else? Is there is there is there a, a something that we're missing? And the Buddha's enlightenment says, yeah, yeah, you're missing the unconditioned, the uncreated, the unoriginated, the unborn. Because if you didn't have, if that did not exist, then you'd always just be bound by stream of consciousness, and then you just try to do the best you can. Oh, we're already doing that. We're trying to do the best we can. So if the deer fly sits on my nose, I swat it away. If it's too hot, I try to make it cooler. And if it's too cool, I try to make it warm. So I'm already trying to make stream of consciousness to some extent comfortable, moral, meaningful, uh, aesthetically beautiful, and, and, and so on. And then there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But if that's the only thing I'm doing, swatting deer flies and making nice pictures, if that's the only thing I'm doing, then, then my whole life is simply in the conditioned realm. And that's what most of the world does. It, it, it devoted to the conditioned realm. I can devote my attention to the conditioned realm in a very altruistic way. You know, I can serve and I can help. And that's good. That, that brings a good result to the world and to my own heart. Or I can look at the conditioned realm and just try to exploit it and, and get from it every, every ounce of pleasure that I can, disregarding everyone else. And that also has its effect. But both, even even altruism, if it's simply based on doing good, that is still focused on the condition, the conditioned realm. So without being selfish and nasty, we don't have to do that. Uh, we have this this enigma, this koan. There is the unconditioned, the uncreated, the unoriginated, the unborn. And so the way the like we. This morning and last night we were chanting the um, uh, Anatta Lakana Sutta, the the discourse on on not not self, and that's a that's a particular unique I think aspect of of the Buddha's offering to us is the is this teaching on not self. Take your thoughts, take your thoughts. When the thinking mind is generating thoughts, which it is much of the time, I think you've noticed. It's generating those thoughts, and there is a feeling that I am the thinker. Yeah? I'm the thinker who is producing these thoughts. I'm the guy that is thinking too much, or, or I'm thinking the wrong thing, or I'm thinking great things, or I'm just thinking about various fantasies or stories that come up. But the teaching of Anatta said there is no thinker. And that's pretty radical, don't you think? <laughs> Who thinks? So the, the sense of, of, of me being the thinker is that I'm, I'm this guy and I'm producing these thoughts. Thoughts of love, thoughts of hate. This guy called Viradamo. And but if you observe the thinking mind, you'll see that that thoughts are simply produced as aspects of moods. It's like a like a chipmunk has brown fur and a large gray squirrel has gray or black fur. And a snake has a certain covering uh, and the deer has a certain covering, a certain kind of fur. And it's the same with the moods of the mind they not only have feeling component and that, but they also have a, they present themselves in a thinking form. And if you, you observe, you think you're thinking, but what's happening? You, you have a, you're in a mood of resentment or the, a resentful mood is, is manifesting in consciousness. And that's going to have, the form of that is going to be resentful thoughts. And that'll have a sense of me. Why don't they do this, or why don't they do that, or they shouldn't have done this, or they shouldn't have done that? If you have a, a very uh, lustful thoughts, and you're, you have a kind of lot of lustful energy, then that will have, oh, that would be nice, or that would be nice, or fantasy, or, or whatever. 
or if you have very uh, you're creating something, you're building something, then you'll be out there building something. And all the time, these different moods are producing thoughts, or they are thoughts. You know, they they're not really separate. They just it's their 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 character has thought in them, and these these are produced just through what we call dependent origination. The thoughts depend on the mood. You don't have really inspiring thoughts when you're full of self-doubt, right? You may put, you may think you can put them in there, but you don't, you, you, it just, it just comes up as a mood. And so what happens with self-view and the sense of personal identity with thought uh, is, is you, you get in there and you try to be the one that's always fixing the thoughts putting other thoughts in and, and thinking you shouldn't think that and then getting caught up in thoughts and so on and so forth. So all the time, your attention is on the conditioned. Even if you're trying to think good thoughts, your attention is still on the conditioned. It's always in, and, and much, you know, how much of our time is spent in that thinking mode? So the what, what I was trying to offer this last week was that when you when you have something very predominant in consciousness, like a strong like a strong mood, it really dominates, doesn't? It? Like like if you re, you really you let's say you've got a lot of self doubt running. This is this this really strong mood, and and what we, we we tend to do through what we call attachment grasping is we just get involved in that strong mood, try to analyze it, try to figure it out, try to get rid of it, try to think other thoughts, but all the time our attention is on the conditioned realm. It's still conditioned, it's not unconditioned. So the teaching of, of dependent origination is a way of extracting the sense of self from that. What the Pali Canon offers, rather than self-view, it offers dependent origination. It says, these kinds of thoughts arise dependent on causes and conditions. When you are in a good mood, when a good mood is there, that's what arises, good thoughts. When you are in a bad mood, bad thoughts arise. They're dependent, they're originated. And, and this is the way out of self-view. This is the way out of self-view. If you're thinking and you say, oh, this depends, this thought depends. It depends on what's come before. It depends on the mood of the mind. And then what you do, then what you do is you begin to question what is not dependent, what is unconditioned. You put that question into your mind. What is not dependent, what is unconditioned. What that does is rather than going forward into the khandhas, into the stream of consciousness, into thought, trying to sort it out, you no longer grasp it. You don't grab it anymore. You go, well, what's unconditioned? Your mind doesn't grasp it. What is un if you ask that question right now, like let's say if you feel really hot, and you really feel the heat, and then you say, that's dependent. My body, the body heat depends on the temperature in the room. It's dependently originated. It depends. So what doesn't depend? What doesn't depend on the heat in this room? What doesn't depend on bodily feelings? And that's the kind of questioning you need to put into consciousness. Not an analytical questioning, but a kind of questioning that really makes you pay attention. What, what, you know, what's going on? But not to fix the stream of consciousness, not to get an experience other than the one that is exhibiting itself, rather what is unconditioned, what is uncreated. And if you ask that sincerely, your mind will go silent because any thought or anything is always conditioned, so it always takes you back to this ineffable silence of knowing the way things are, rather than always be caught in the conditioned realm. So Buddhism isn't about just, I don't see at least, just being a nice guy or a nice gal. That helps, you know, it helps rather than killing people or whatever. But its point is not, it's not like a psychological becoming. You know, it's not like you're becoming something, like a better person. Being a better person is fine, and I, I hope you all 
continually become better people in some way. But that that, that exercise of, of self-improvement is so often just just grounded in this feeling that I should be someone who's different. And then the thinking mind grabs that. You know, I should be someone who's different, bigger, smaller, more beautiful, more more skilled, or you know, whatever whatever language you want. And you're still you're still attending to thought. You're still attending to emotion. You're still attending to stream of consciousness. So is stream of consciousness the only thing going on right now? So what do we have in stream of consciousness? I have sound. I can see someone nodding. <laughs> I can I can feel a fly in my back. I can have a memory. That's stream of consciousness, right? And that's all changing. And that depends. That depends on all kinds of things. The flies depend on whatever. My memories depend on what I've done. My emotions depend on the kind of a day I had today, yesterday. And that all depends. So this flow of consciousness depends. So what is it that doesn't depend? What is it that's the same after 10 minutes of the fan blowing? What's the same before the mosquito bites you and after the mosquito bites you? What's the same when you feel physically sick or physically well? You know what? Where is the, what is the unconditioned? That kind of a question is not looking for a, an intellectual answer. It's bringing us to the silence of no thought, the silence of awareness, and the silence of presence. Because what you know for sure is that there is consciousness, something's going on right there's or there's presence his presence so even even when you if i move from here to there if i pick this up like i just feel that right i feel hardness and so on and i see the liquid moving in the glass and i put the glass down and all of that what was unchanging in that in that experience so when naomi scratched her chin or when you moved your knee, or what what was unchanging there? That was changing. What's unchanging? And that's presence, isn't it? So presence or consciousness or awareness or knowing. What is that? Well, you you know you can't find that. You can't locate it as an object because it's not stream of consciousness. It's consciousness without the stream. <laughs> without the objects. It's ineffable. It's being, it's presence, it's knowing, it's awareness. It's the way things are, these different ways we talk about it. So you can do ex do exercises like that, like, you know, like do something that requires concentration. You know, so I, I feel, I feel my hand on the glass and I, and I squeeze it. I don't have to break the glass and I don't think I could do it anyway. But in the squeezing, I say, there's change. There's change. It was unchanging. And then I move that. So what's unchanging? Right? You're very deliberate. Very, very deliberate. You do that with the breath. Because it's not the breath that's important in meditation. It's the knowing. You know, do that with a body sweeping. Do that with a visualization. Whatever you want. It's not the object of meditation. It's the knowing, the awareness. Because that sense of presence is the key to the unconditioned it's the doorway it's 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 really what's important and if you think about it you contemplate that all conditions doesn't matter how beautiful ugly nasty fa fabulous the conditioned realm is the stream of consciousness is doesn't really matter because presence it all of them point to presence you couldn't have that experience if there wasn't presence. You couldn't have the experience if there wasn't consciousness. You couldn't have the experience if there wasn't knowing. So all conditions point to that. And the only problem we have, really, is we're looking in the wrong place. It's like you're, I'm looking out rather than looking in or noticing. So I suggest that when, when you, you know, when you have a, a, an intense, especially intense feelings, they're, they're actually very good for this exercise. Let's say you have a really intense feeling of dislike for someone. 
I don't quite, or, or fear of something. That's a very strong sankara in the mind. It's very, very strong. Now, attachment just goes hell bent with thinking. So I think most of us have enough mindfulness to know, oh wow, this is a strong emotion. So the unreflective kind of person just believes in their anger, believes in their fear, follows them, and so so be it. So they're slaves to that. But all of us have enough sense of distance and perspective to know this is an object. You can see if you if you can't do that, if you can't see stream of objects as objectively, then you're you're toast. Then that's how you got. You get stream of consciousness. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Most of the time it's just muddling along. But because we can be objective, we can we can we can say that is a mood. We can do that as a thought. We can do that. We can do that. Then if you have a really, really difficult mood or, or, or strong mood, can you remember just to kind of really feel the mood and notice the thinking and all that and say, what's not the mood? What's unconditioned? What's not dependent? What is dependently originated? So you ask a question which is no longer engage with trying to fix your mind. Because that's what we're often trying to do out of very good intention. You know, not it's not, I mean, it's very good to try to do that. So we're always trying to fix things. <laughs> How many years do we have to fix it, right? But what if it's okay? What if it doesn't need fixing? The plumbing needs fixing. If you break your leg, you better, cat, you know, put a cast on it. Yeah. But maybe the whole object is not to fix things, to be correct in some preconceived Buddhist, non-Buddhist way, but just to know that the stream of consciousness is this way. And that the object is not to fix it, but just to know it as something that flows and changes. And that points always to the unconditioned. And that's a different exercise. So certainly, we have exercise to try to fix things. So if I'm rampantly angry all the time and, and, and abusive, then we have social norms, we have norms around right speech, and the attempt to be more kind, which is great, which is great. But what happens oftentimes is when we're always just trying to substitute or, or put something else in, we never let things cease. We never let a mood cease. It never really ends because we haven't, we haven't really allowed it to be fully manifest in consciousness. And what happens is we don't, ha like when you, when you do this kind of exercise, what is unconditioned? What you find is because you're not, tr you're not trying to fix it anymore, you're not just engaged in it all the time, your body releases it. You, you find that you're, you know, that whole idea of trying to fix your mind is, is a lot of tension. It's a lot of me doing, doing whatever I do, doing Buddhism or doing self-help. <laughs> but it's still a kind of me doing something to the conditioned realm. But w what I find is that if I, if I put that kind of questioning to myself, what is unconditioned? Now, my mind, my, my desire mind will seek something called the unconditioned. That doesn't work. Because there's no condition you can find. And it's not something you find. But just the very question, what is right now? Because, because if it's unconditioned, uncreated, unoriginated, unformed, not a matter of time, not born, not dying, it has to be always here and now. It can't be in the next meditation or 10 minutes from now in some future. It has to be here and now. So something right here, imminent, transcendent, has to be. You have to get, you have to, get to that sense of this practice is not a time-bound practice. I'm not trying to do something to become something later. But rather... I'm allowing an inquiry which takes me deeply into the present moment, very, very deeply. By what? By a question. So right now, what is unconditioned? So I hear the fan. What is unconditioned? What is unoriginated, unformed, unborn? And the mind begins to know space. It knows silence. And, and these are ineffable. They have no limits. They have no boundaries. You know, when we talk about the Datu teaching, the, the element teaching, we talk about earth, water, fire, and air. And that was the way in, in physics in the time of India that you talked about the material realm, earth, water, fire, air. But we also talk about consciousness and space. And consciousness and space are unlimited, unbounded. 
and our attention tends to be very bounded by our thoughts and our emotions and our self-definitions and our bodies and our histories, da da da, or our hobbies or our passions or our our political views or non-views or whatever. So our our attention is very much bound and it doesn't know the unlimited. And so the the suggestion then is well, you know, do you do exercises like? Is, does consciousness really have a limit? Can you find an edge to consciousness? And it's not, again, it's, it's not something you try to figure out. Just, well, oh, consciousness, where's its limit? I can't find a limit. I just know there is consciousness. Or space. You know, is there a limit to space? There's, there's trees, which limits my visual perception, but is there a limit to space? And you start to do exercises like this to release this constant attention on the conditioned realm. This constant kind of engagement with thought and with emotion and and you begin to just say, what is what is what is always here, no matter what is changing? And that kind of questioning begins to create what we mean by non grasping. And then in non grasping, the karmic result like in Ajahn Chah's teaching that we read this morning, the comic results come up, the resentments or the fears and so on, but now, now they, because one isn't engaging in them, one isn't attached to them, right? What happens is the body begins to relax with them and they come through the body and they get liberated from consciousness because there's no, no longer this trying to fix it. But if we don't do that, well, I, I think what happens is, is, is our sense of self gets in there, tries to fix it, and they never get liberated. And this can be, this can be uncomfortable. You, you can feel quite queasy in the stomach, or your heart can feel really contracted, or you can have an outpouring of, of resentful thoughts. And that will, that will run its course if one allows it to run its course. But we, we tend not to be patient enough. We tend not to trust in this deep, deep sense of presence, deep, deep sense of it's all okay. And it's not, it's not our task now to sort it all out because our task is the uncreated. It's a relief. <laughs> you think you don't have to be the perfect personality. I mean, I should, I can make a fortune on that. <laughs> you don't have to be sweet and nice and kind but you know you can you can have those feelings on action and speech yeah you know we 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 have we have protocol we have etiquette we have good karma in terms of the way we relate to others but but to be a person who never feels crappy or who never feels just totally fed up with your partner wife or monastery <laughs> or the abbot <laughs> or who always just thinks the most sweet thoughts about all poor people rather than that bum why doesn't get a job or you know it, it's like this kind of we can get very very pc wet <laughs> perfect kind of ideal mind but our, our we're not you know we have like i want to kill this fly <laughs> <laughs> these, these are impulses that come up i'm an animal i have an animal body right I've got memories that, that stored up that, you know, come up, you know, stuff from childhood come up and I feel bloody minded sometimes. And now, is that wrong? You know, is it is, is life just this kind of smarmy soap opera that but it's not, is it? What's you know, what is the reality of life is that as much as you would like to be a kind, sensitive, generous, wise, caring person all the time to everyone in every situation till death do you part it doesn't happen why because it's natural it's natural to feel negative things now what happens so a negative thing comes up you know like in a monastery or towards your teacher towards a, a fellow monastic towards your partner towards your kids is that the problem is the nasty feeling the problem? If you act on it, yeah, that's that's going to be a problem because that's going to create more of that. And socially, it's going to be not good. So action and speech, we always say, no, act in a good way. Live morally. 
try to be sensitive to people, try to help people. But the impulse to hurt, the arising of negativity, is that, is that, are we, is our practice one where we're always trying to be people who never have these impulses? If that's true, we're in trouble. <laughs> but if our practice is non-grasping and living a moral life, and living a life of, of sensitivity as much as possible in the moment. And the task is the unconditioned, realize the unconditioned. Yeah? I realize the unconditioned, then all conditions can point to that. So even a, a really horrible state of mind, if you have the willingness and patience to say, well, what's uncreated here? What's unoriginated? What was there before? that horrible thought came up and what's there afterwards. You start to abide with that, then the horrible thought manifests, but it manifests in a much more kind of distant way. It's not kind of in your face anymore, grabbing your heart. It's like it's this movement. And because now you understand non-grasping, that movement has a chance to fully mature in your body as well as your thoughts in your body and it gets liberated, and your mind is relieved and released. And this is the ideas of Niroda, the cessation of these things. The craving mind doesn't want that. The craving mind, quite often our craving mind, has this kind of self-identity that I shouldn't have these things, and it creates all kinds of problems. But non-craving, non-becoming, knowing, these are, these are the watchwords of the transcendent path. If we don't have the transcendent path, then we're not, you know, we don't, we don't have Buddhism. We have, we have humanism, and we have good psycho psychology. These are good things; they're not wrong. But, but to me, it seems the Buddhist teaching wasn't. He wasn't the ultimate therapist, as someone once said. You know that that it wasn't. It wasn't like rearranging the psychological content of your mind. It's seeing that all content flows through causes and conditions, and there's the unconditioned, the uncreated. So I'd ask you to try that, give that a go, like like um, next week, at one time when you might feel a bit upset, <laughs> in case that happens to you, and then rather than make it a problem, you know, rather make it a problem, can you ask yourself, well, what's, what's unconditioned here? What's uncreated? Because because the strength of the of the arising, of the emotion arising or the memory whatever, grabs all your attention, and it's a kind of interesting focus. It's a focus on the condition, but now what you're doing is you're rever you're taking that very consuming part of this emotion, and you're actually reversing it, and you're using the intensity to say, well, what's not intense, or what's what doesn't arise and doesn't cease. And it's brilliant because then you begin to see, oh yeah, there's the knowing, there's awareness. And then you train in that, you train in that, and you train in that. And what you'll find is then your sense of the path becomes much, much more in the moment, in the moment, in the moment, in the moment, rather than sorting things out for some later experience, for some kind of later experience. So from the Pali Canon, when people ask, you know, we say that, that thoughts are not self, emotions are not self, and then people ask, well, yeah, but it's happening. We say, yeah, it's happening, but it depends. It's dependently originated. This, the body I, the, bo the body that comes through this conscious experience is a 70-year-old body, and it, you know, it has certain feelings and certain history and so on. That's all. The, the memory forms that come up, conditioned by life in Toronto or life in New Zealand, they depend. They come up because of, they're dependently originated. But the sense of me as a person in there, the Buddha said, there's no person doing this. And that's very radical. I'm not doing my own suffering. Suffering depends on causes and conditions. And so the way out is not so much as a, it's not so much of, of a doing as an awakening, more like a, a awakening to truth. This is the way it is now, rather than doing something so that you're not this in a future tomorrow or whenever.
And then things do work out. You know, fears and desires, they all do cease because there is no longer identity. There's, ident there's identity with silence. There's then or identity. Say there is there is silence. There is peace. And the letting go of identity to this this flow, then there's flow too, which is alright. Flow of consciousness, that's alright. So I would like be encouraged in your in your practice not to worry if you've got, you know, kind of unpleasant emotions or ugly emotions. And it's not no one's fault. Not a problem. If you can be patient and allow it to be just as it is, that's the secret. It's always patience. That's really the secret. So when they come up, then we say, oh, I have to do something. No, no. What's unconditioned? And the doing is like trying to change the conditions. All right. I'll leave that for your reflection. Sadu, sadu, sadu.